Chapter Chalom, we greet you. This is Hebrew Readers Church. We thank you all for tuning in with us and continually supporting the church. Um, I'm your brother Zachariah. Um, brother Kasafo couldn't be with us here today, so we just ask that you keep him in your prayers. We just sincerely love doing the work and, and sincerely love communing with you all. Uh, everybody who's been sending emails, everyone that's been tuning in to the lessons, we just thank you and, and appreciate your continual support. The lesson we're doing today is foul speech affects your soul. So with no further ado, we're going to jump right into it. In this world we live in, it's almost impossible to not hear foul speech or cursing in your everyday communication with other people. For we know that it's a spirit that's guiding them to speak in such a way, knowing that speech will vex the spirit of those practicing righteousness to stumble. Maybe you're still speaking in a way that's not pleasing to Allah Hayyam, and you're not being a righteous example to the unbelievers in Christ. This is a builder lesson to strengthen our brothers and sisters and encourage them to walk in a way not pleasing to men, but pleasing to Allah Hayyam. All right, now first we're going to look in the first word, and we're going to look into obscenity so we can gain an understanding. Obscenity, the definition is the state or quality of being obscene. Obscene behavior, language, or images. Now, this is a very interesting definition, right? Because obscene can be your behavior. It's not only your speech. It's the way you operate, the way you carry yourself. This is obscenity. And also your language, of course, that's what we're getting into today. Or images. So it can, we, we know what graven images are. Anybody that's been following us, we know what graven images are. Now, obscene images are images that are showing bad behavior. So, even in this definition, we know that graven images also can depict something. And in this sense, it's a negative or an obscene way. An extremely offensive word or expression. So, obscenity is also an extremely offensive word or expression so these are the things that we want to stay away from and this is a worldly aspect from the definition of obscenity synonyms curse a swear word profanity four letter word or dirty word obscenity is socially offensive language which may also be called curse words or swearing Curse words, swear words, bad words, blasphemous language, vulgar language, lewd language, choice words, or profanity. Now, the servants of Allah, we have to stray away from these things because our donor, Yache, Christ, he's given us strict commandments of how we are to operate through the prophets, through the apostles, and, and this is what we're supposed to follow. Obscenity or foul speech is known as filthy communication or filthiness according to the scriptures. So now we're going to take the worldly information and compare it to the scriptures to gain understanding. We're going to go to Colossians chapter 3 verse 8. I'll give you a moment to get there. But now ye also put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Now, this was a commandment from Paul that we're supposed to put filthy communication from out of our mouth, right? Now, the definition of filthy communication is G148. It means foul speaking, low and obscene speech. So this is why we went into the definition of a theme from the beginning of the lesson. Because we're, we're touching on that. We're going into a broader band of obscenity so that we can truly understand what is commanded and what is um, expected of us in our day to day lives, in our day to day behavior. Vile conversation, filthy communication. So we're going to look into some of these words so that we can get an understanding. Vile. Morally base or impure, sinful, depraved by sin, wicked, extremely unpleasant. Okay, 
We went into obscene, but we're going to go into a couple of other definitions of the word itself. Obscene, offensive, impure, expressing or presenting to the mind or view something which delicacy, purity, and decency forbid. As obscene language, foul, filthy, offensive, disgusting. Now, there's something in that definition that I really want to point out so that we can gain an understanding of this, that filthy or obscene language, it, it doesn't just stop with the words that come out of your mouth, because the words have to come from somewhere, right? So not only can your words and actions be obscene, but also your mind. This is why Paul stressed that we be renewed in our mind and heart in Romans 12 and 2 and Ephesians 4 and 23. And I'm going to read the definition of obscene again so that you can see that it's your mind as well, not just your speech and your behavior. Offensive and pure, expressing or presenting to the mind or view something with delicacy. So it perverts your mind. It perverts the way you see things. Because it's a, it's a mindset. To be obscene or to have an obscene mindset is what Paul was actually referring to by, he said, the renewing of your mind. Because we can't think the way that we used to think. We can't speak the way that we used to speak. Because if we think in that matter, it's going to come out of our mouth. Because the mouth speaketh with the heart, uttereth. So what you actually feel in your heart what you actually think in your mind actually comes out of your mouth and it comes to fruition in your behavior. So we have to change our mindset so that we can be more Christ-like and that we can walk uprightly and not operate in the obscenity. Right? I'm going to give you some more adjectives to obscene. Of the portrayal or description of sexual matters, offensive or disgusting by accepted standards of morality and decency, offending against moral principles. So the law and righteousness would seem to be contrary to you if you had a mindset of obscenity. You wouldn't want to do the things that are commanded us that are upright. You would only want to do that which seemeth good in your own sight. The way you speak is a reflection of the spirit that is within you. For if we speak in vile and obscene language, it shows we are walking away from sound doctrine, but we were commanded not to let corrupt communication come forth out of our mouth. This is why we have to strive not to let it come forth from our mouth. And if we are communing with someone that's dealing with the spirit, pray for them to save their soul. For even a man of righteousness, Moses warned us of such works when he was given our fathers the dietary law. All right, we're going to jump over to Barnabas chapter 10, verse 8. Moreover, he hath hated the weasel also. Now, this is Moses. He's going into the dietary law. He's also given the spirit, the spiritual understanding of the dietary law. Because there's more than just what we're not supposed to eat. We're also not supposed to operate like these animals as well. Ahaya's work is amazing. Things are way greater than what we understand. The book of Barnabas, chapter 10, verse 8. Moreover, he hath hated the weasel also, and with good reason. Thou shalt not, saith he, become such as those men of whom we hear as working iniquity out of their mouth for uncleanness. Neither shalt thou cleave unto impure women who work iniquity with their mouth. For this animal conceiveth with his mouth. And this is what we're not supposed to be like. We're not supposed to be like the weasel that conceiveth iniquity out of the mouth. Now this is going to hit home for many people, including myself. All right? I want y'all to hear this. Seeing how the weasel operates and you hanging around people on the regular who operate like the weasel. Because this is many people's friends, right? Many people, the uncleanness comes out of their mouth. They speak with foul language all the time. It's always sexual perversion coming out of their mouth. Different type of things, right? We all have a so-called friend that acts like this. 
let's see how this plan will affect our walk in the gospel because we know this is the spirit okay we're going to jump over to barnabas chapter 4 verse 2 let us give no relaxation to our soul that it should have liberty to consort with sinners and wicked men least happily we be made like unto them now i'm not talking about somebody that's trying to get it right I'm talking about those people that are comfortable with their life. They have no desire to change. These are the people you have to operate from a distance. You have to love them from a distance because they're looking to bring you down. They're not looking to change and to grow with you. They're looking to keep you where you are. And our whole thing is about growth. We all have to endure this journey. That's why Yache said he is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the journey. He's the path. Now, if we're hanging around these weasels that are speaking iniquity and unrighteousness through their mouth all the time, eventually that spirit is going to start rubbing off on you. And it's going to cleave unto you. And you're going to find yourself speaking in a way, your mindset, these thoughts. When somebody does something, you might have a thought and you might say foul language in your mind, but it might not come out of your mouth. You can see the progression of the iniquity that's rubbing off on you, that's causing you to now start to stumble in the faith, to stumble in the gospel. So even in that, you have to be very true with yourself in this situation to see that those people that you're hanging around are actually affecting you. Though you might not get to the point that you're acting upon it, it's in your mind. It's already entered into your heart. And this is what we have to be aware of so that we can continue walking forward in the truth of the gospel and righteousness. We will fall into their snares and become like them. That's why we said the speech is moved by a spirit. And when that spirit attaches to you, you are moved by the same spirit they are moved by. That's why we overcome by not letting corrupt communication come forth out of our mouth. See, these commandments that Ahia gave these prophets and these apostles, was for our benefit because they knew the spirits that were going to be attacking us, especially at the end of the days. Because even in our father, Jacob, he was prophesying to the 12 tribes. And of course, a lot of the Gentiles fall into the same thing because these spirits attack everybody. So they understood the spirits that were going to be attacking us and how to overcome it. That was the whole thing. All the gospel was for us for us to understand how to overcome the spiritual so that we can live in the spirit, how to overcome the flesh so we can live in the spirit. So it's all for our benefit. Now we were admonished not to let filthy communication come forth out of our mouth. We're going to jump over to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Now we're going to get the definition of corrupt communication. It's G4550. The definition is rotten, that it's worthless, literally or morally, bad, corrupt. Now you might say, communication, how is communication rotten? Because it's dead. When something is rotten, it's died. It's completely rotted out. That's why it's called worthless. Nobody wants to be speaking words and having our speech being worthless. We want our speech to be worth something. We want it to help people, to build people up, to bring people further to the gospel. But we can't be cursing and preaching the gospel. Or else does that make Christ the minister of sin? The minister of unrighteousness? Allah and forbid. We can't be sinning and saying that we're upholding the gospel at the same time. We can't be speaking foul language and saying that we're upholding the gospel and we're bringing people to the truth. You know, the truth is to awake to righteousness. Not just to know who you are, but to do good works, to keep the commandments, to bear the fruits of the Spirit, to be an example of Christ. So we have to really put this corrupt communication away from us so that we can walk according to the Spirit.
Now we can see the dichotomy by looking at the works and behaviors as to those that become saints, right? So the admonishments to the saints, we can look at those and look at the things they, that they were supposed to stray from and the things that they were supposed to do to see the dichotomy of someone operating in obscenity. Now we're going to jump over to Ephesians chapter 5 verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becoming saints. So these are the things we're supposed to stray from. Verse 4, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. All right, now we're going to go through these words so that we can gain an understanding. All right? So we have filthiness is the first one. It's G151. If you have the strong coordinates, you can look up the words and, and see the definitions. Filthiness, shamefulness, that is obscenity. So now we're running to the same word, obscenity. Shamefulness, that is obscenity, filthiness. An extremely offensive word or expression. In a minute, we're going to take this to the next level so that we can understand what exactly this means. This is why we were commanded for those that believe for our speech to be seasoned with salt, because we can't speak offensive words to people. We can't offend people. Right? That's what Christ was warning us about. He said, offenses shall come, but woe unto him by whom offenses come. So we have to have our speech seasoned with salt. We have to speak in a way where it's not offensive, as becoming saints, because this is all about becoming saints. Right? This is the admonishments for the people of righteousness that are practicing righteousness. Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Now, we see another dichotomy of obscenity. From the righteous to the impure. For the righteous are the walk in wisdom, while the impure walk in obscenity. Now, these are admonishments for the walk in wisdom, right? This is why our speech is seasoned with salt. This is why our behavior is good, because we're, we're operating in wisdom. According to situations, we're being temperate. We're thinking. We're not reacting out of emotions. We're thinking about what's right in the sight of al at all times. We're not losing control of our mind, our heart, our soul. But we have a sound mind. We're keeping the Lord's commandments and his admonishments and his wisdom at all times in our mind and in our hearts. So that when we come into a situation where we're being tested, we can overcome it by doing the things that we were commanded and doing the things that we learned through our experiences and the things that we learned through the wisdom of Elohim so that we can overcome the test. Or the temptation. Amid Colossians 4 and 6. Let your speech be always with grace. Now we are commanded for our speech to always be with grace. We're always supposed to speak in a way that can be received. Not in a way that's foul or rotten or worthless. Because if somebody is trying to get admonition or somebody does something wrong. And you start railing at them. You start yelling at them. They're not going to receive what you're saying. But if you speak in a way that's graceful, they'll hear you. Your words will be seasoned with salt. Your words will be taken, not as worthlessness, but it'll be taken as fine gold. So this is how we're supposed to operate according to the righteousness of Elohim and not according to the ways of the world. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Now, if we're operating in this spirit, we're going to know how to answer every man because we're going to be walking in wisdom, giving that answer, that righteous answer, seasoned with salt to all men. No matter the situation, no matter the circumstance, we're going to be ready because we know how we were instructed to operate. We know how we were instructed to think. We know our heart is in the right place. And our behavior showeth forth all these things. All right, the next one is 
foolish talking. Foolish talking coming from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4. Silly talk, that is buffoonery, foolish talking. Now I'm going to give you the definition of buffoonery. Behavior that is ridiculous but amusing. So this is like being the class clown. You do things just to get a reaction. You do things just to get the attention. You're the attention seeker. And this is how we're not supposed to operate as becoming saints. We're not supposed to be that person that's just saying something random just to get people's attention or just to get people to laugh. And it's called foolish talking. Now, there's nothing wrong with telling a joke, you know, in righteousness. But to say something foolish or something outlandish just to get attention or just to make people laugh, that's what they're actually referring to. The next one is jesting. That's G2610. Meaning well turned. That is ready to reparte. Jocosi. Witticism. That is jesting. All right. Witticism. That is in a vulgar sense. Ribaldry. Jesting. Now, witticism. That is in a vulgar sense. Now, we know those people that are very witty. Like, you might say something to them and they have the quickest response. Like, their response might even be offensive. And you're like, you know, like, they might even make a, a comment about, like, your sister or your mom or, or something in that sense. And you're like, you know, like, yeah, you just took it to the next level. You know, I wasn't even going in that direction. But they're so witty, and it shows forth the, the spirit they're operating in. So this is how we're not supposed to operate. Because our speech is supposed to be seasoned with salt. And we're supposed to walk in wisdom. Now, reparty is conversation or speech characterized by quick, witty comments or replies. Right? And ribaldry, we'll give the definition. Ribaldry, referring to sexual matters in an amusingly coarse or irrelevant way. Now, that'd be like the comment, like, you might say something and they say, well, your mama didn't, you know, so that's the witticism, the jesting that Allah tells us not to operate in. We're supposed to be upright and cursing somebody's mother is, of course, unrighteous and it's going to offend somebody. And we're not supposed to be offending people. But our speech is supposed to be seasoned with salt. We have to be very careful with what comes out of our mouth, but Christ warned us of such works and what the reward is. Now, I know everybody here, we're here for a purpose. We're here because we want to learn and be like Christ. We don't want to continue in the way to the world. So we have to truly take the admonitions. Right. Thank you, Brother Kafafo. Brother Kafafo just threw something in for jesting. Contemning the holy things with jest and laughter. So we can't be laughing about transgression. So if somebody falls, you can't laugh at it. Or if somebody sins, you can't laugh at it. Like, that's the same thing as far as jesting. You know, you're very witty. They might have done something wrong, and you're making fun of them. You know, so we have to be very careful about that. And about standing in the mind frame of lifting our brothers up and not bringing them down. I'm jumping over to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of Elohim. Now it said unclean person. That's what I wanted to touch on. Right? Because our speech is... When, our, when we speak in a way of unrighteousness, it makes us unclean. And this is what Christ was actually warning us about. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 18 and 19, he was warning us that we have to, we have to guard our speech. We have to guard our words. We have to guard our behavior. We have to guard our mind and our heart. Or else we'll be found sinners. Matthew 5 and 18. But those things which proceed out of the mouth, which come forth from the heart, 
and they defile the man. Now you see how Yahche was giving us the understanding. Where does the foul speech proceed from? The foul speech proceeds from your heart and it comes out of your mouth. So we have to be very careful with what's in our heart. We have to be very careful. This is why Paul was given instruction for us to renew the mind. Circumcise your heart so that we can truly rid of the obscenity and the uncleanness within our heart that causes us to be an unclean vessel. I'm at verse 19 in Matthew 15. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. So it's the heart that brings forth all of these things. Now the heart is an organ, just like your brain is an organ. And both of those are what leads a man to do what he's going to do. Now, if your heart is leading you to do iniquity, you're going to do iniquity because you're following your heart. If your mind is telling you to do iniquity, you're going to be in a straight between doing what's right and doing what's wrong. And your mind can lead you to do iniquity. So this is what evil proceeds out of if we don't renew it. If we don't give it the righteous nourishment to transform it into doing what's right and not doing what's easy and what's pleasing to the flesh or pleasing to the mind, then we can't overcome it. But if we're replacing those evil imaginations if we're replacing those evil thoughts, if we're replacing the lust of the flesh or the, or the lust of the mind with righteousness, we're replacing it with good speech, we're replacing it with speech seasoned with salt, we're replacing it with good behaviors, we're replacing it with wisdom, and we're walking in wisdom and love, we're walking in the grace of Allah, then we can overcome these things by renewing it. And that's what renewing means. Renewing means to renovate. So when you're renovating something, you don't completely reconstruct it. You don't completely destroy it and then build it back up. No, you take the parts that's still good and you use those and you bring in new pieces to, to build it back up. And this is what we have to do with our mind and our heart. Because the good qualities that are within your heart and within your mind, but there's also the bad qualities that need to be broken down. So we keep the good things and we build off of the good things. And that's what makes us unique because every renovation is different based off of what's strong or what's good that's left. And then after that, you can reconstruct it to build it to be something pleasant and something wonderful. Now, if I'm renovating a home, every home is not going to look the same because the way it was constructed, it might be different. The way the paint layout, the colors that we're using might be different. The way the house is shaped might be different. So it makes me have to use or to have a different design, even the accents that are placed within the house would be different based off the look of the house. And that's what makes us all unique. That's what makes us a part of the body. This is like Paul was talking about, the ear can't be the eye because we're all unique in our own way and we all have to be renovated. We all have to keep the strong things that makes us us, the gifts that Elohim gave us. Like one might be discerning spirits. That might be a great thing you have going on within your heart, but you might have several things that are full of iniquity that have to be rooted out. But yet that, that stone, that, that pearl that's within you is still good. We just have to remove everything that's around that pearl that's causing it not to be able to shine, right? We are commanded to let our speech be with grace, seasoned with salt, 
in sound speech that the unbelievers may not be able to blaspheme the true doctrine of Elohim. And by our sound and righteous speech, those people that are opposed to the gospel may be converted by our examples as believers. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 Be ye therefore followers of Elohim as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and sacrifice to Elohim for a sweet-smelling Savior. We are exhorted to speak in truth, in love with grace as Christ showing his goodness in us. So we're always supposed to be examples. We're always supposed to be doing that which is good and pleasing in his sight. And understanding and trusting that his wisdom and the things that he commands us is right and good. And it's going to lead us to gaining the kingdom that we all desire. I'm jumping over to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. But speaking in truth and love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now, these good works deliver us from being evil spoken of, but speaking in truth and love. Now, this is taking us to another level. When we're speaking in truth and love, Just like he said that our speech is supposed to be seasoned with salt and we're not supposed to offend our brother. But at the same time, we have to walk in wisdom because we have to tell them the truth. Now, the truth isn't always what they want to hear. And the truth isn't always pleasing. So this is why we need the wisdom and we need our speech to be in love and grace so that we can actually speak to the person about what's true and that they'll be able to receive it. It's hard. It's a task. It's harder than just railing off and, and just saying what's true, but just saying it in a so mean of a fashion that nobody can receive it. We actually have to do the contrary and speak in a way that's so pleasant that nobody can blaspheme us or speak against us and where nobody can say, I can't receive it because of the way you delivered it. So it takes us to another level. It takes us to to do things more righteously on a whole new level of good so that people can receive it, so that people can see our good behavior and that they will understand that it's Christ in us that's operating, that's speaking the words unto them so that they can receive it. So we have a great calling. In Yache, because he's placing us at so high of a standard that we have to at all times be on guard. We have to at all times know our surroundings. We have to at all times walk in wisdom. We have to at all times speak in a way that's pleasant so that the gospel of Christ be not blasphemed. That's why Paul said, if Elohim be exalted by my lie, how am I yet considered a sinner? And if I said that wrong, I'm sorry. I had to go and look that up just to make sure I said it right. It's Romans chapter 3 verse 7. For if the truth of Elohim hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? So that was Romans 3 and 7, the one that I quoted. But we can operate in Christ and claim Christ, but yet be found sinners. Yeah, there's some things that we may struggle with, but our speech can't be one of them. Our behavior can't be one of them because we're blaspheming him. And we truly have to continue in this journey and in this walk so that our mind can be renewed, so that we can think righteously that we may examine all things by the law and by the fruits of the Spirit. Even when that burning, when somebody does something to you or somebody offends you, that burning that goes in your heart, sit on your bed, calm down, so that you can take the time out to think logically and think in wisdom and righteousness. Remember the fruits of the Spirit. Joy goodness, 
gladness, temperance, meekness, so that we can understand what spirit we're operating in, what spirit is attacking us, so that we can go and speak to that person with grace and explain to them in a way where they'll be able to receive it. And even if they don't receive it, when you're speaking in grace and your speech season with salt, then you have to dust the dust from off your boots because you did what was right. You didn't come back with railing and cursing. You came back and you spoke to them in righteousness and they didn't receive it. Now, if later that brother or sister comes back and repents for what they've done, then receive them. Receive them with open arms and, and forgive them. But we have to do our part. We have to do our part and operate in righteousness because it starts with somebody. It has to start with somebody. And somebody has to be the example. Somebody has to, to walk in the way that's pleasing to Allah so that other people can have an example to walk in the way that's pleasing to Allah You're right. And even if they don't repent, we still have to forgive them from the heart, even as Gad talks about, and leave it unto Allah and just pray for them. Because we don't know the end of a person. It may be they'll repent of something, though they may not say it. And you'll just notice a change in their behavior. Also, through their experience, you'll get to learn what you can and can't say to a particular person. And that helps in growing in wisdom to know discernment in speech. Properly discerning when not and when to say something. If nobody does what's right, then nobody is accountable. And this is where we're, we're headed to in this world, is that nobody's doing what's right, so nobody is accountable. And this is where we have to get away from, because it's only going to lead everybody into a ditch. Because when the blind leads the blind, they both fall into a ditch. But now we have to be able to see. We have to be able to walk. We have to be able to talk. We have to be able to, to do so that people can see the righteousness of Allah and that they may have an example and that they may be converted. That they may know it's possible because the world and the direction that we're going in in this world, it's going to seem impossible to do what's right. And the people that Allah is stirring up and the people that He's training, they're going to have to be even stronger in the faith to be an example to those that are without. And we're going to need, we're going to need those examples so that people can't say it's impossible. I can't do it. Look at the way that everybody's operating in the world. It's completely unlike how everybody's operating. And that's going to be for our salvation. Especially the women. That's why it says to the women, let them be won over by your chaff conversation coupled with fear. It's the behavior. The behavior of the women is going to win many people over. Especially seeing the ways of the world and seeing how women are operating and how they're so lifted up nowadays. To see women really be lowly and humble and meek and quiet and speaking righteousness and doing righteousness. Is really going to convert many people and the men to not be given over to fornication, to not be given over to wine, to be speaking in a way that's righteous, to be meek. These are the things that's going to truly turn people's hearts. It's not about how many scriptures I can throw at you, how I can tear you down with scriptures. That's not what's going to win people over. Because that's the obscene speech that's causing people to go away or to stray from the gospel. Because it's offensive. But we're supposed to be operating in a way, walking in wisdom, to convert people so that they can, they can see the goodness of Allah And they can see the goodness of Allah in you. I'm going to jump over to Titus chapter 2 verse 7. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech, 
that cannot be condemned. So remember, we're still looking into the admonishments of the righteous, of those that are practicing righteousness. All right, I'm going to start back over at Titus 2 and 7. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. So our speech has to be sound. So that nobody can say anything about us. Nobody can blaspheme us. Nobody can reproach us. We have to be the example. Because people are looking for anything. They're looking for any and everything. To say that you're not perfect either. So there's nothing you can say to me. So we, on the contrary have to be perfect. We can't keep doing the things that other people are doing, right? Just like being with the weasel. We can't hang around the weasel and expect for the weasel not to rub off on us. So, in the same thing, we have to have a sound speech. We have to have good behavior so that nobody can speak evil of us. To blaspheme the gospel of Christ. Speaking well is a testimony of our conversion. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. I'm going to read um, Ephesians 4 and 22 through 25. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. So the way we're operating, the way we're speaking, we have to put that off. The things that we're doing, we have to put that off. The way we think, we have to put that off. The way, the things that's in our heart, the lust in our heart, we have to put that off. Which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that ye put on the new man, which after Elohim is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, Speak every man truth with his neighbor. Right, so we have to put away lying and speak all truth. But we are members one of another. Right, so we're all in the same body of Christ. We're all members one of another. I'm going to touch on that too. First Corinthians chapter 12. And I want to touch on this because it says we are members one of another. And as I was speaking earlier about the remodeling or the renovation to show how we're all different, but we're all in the body together. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that you were Gentiles to carry away with these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking in the spirit of Elohim calleth Yahweh accursed, and that no man can say that Yahweh is the Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. So, no matter what renovation and what pearl you have within your renovation, it's the same spirit, Yache, who's operating in each one of us. That's what makes us the body of Christ. And there are no differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it's the same Elohim, which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man the prophet with all. For to one is given the spirit by the word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge by the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse tongues, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh one in the selfsame spirit. Dividing to every man severally as he will. 
For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. For if the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath Elohim set the members, every one of them, in a the body, as it has pleased him. So we all have that pearl. We all have that special pearl within us that we have to, to find and that we have to remove all the other things that are causing that pearl not to shine so that it can be renovated, so that we can put other things that are going to help that pearl shine forth. I'm going to jump over to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. We're almost finished, everybody. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of Elohim, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So we grieve the spirit by operating on righteousness and not keeping the commandments. Speaking words according to obscenity actually grieve the spirit. This is why many of you may have come into knowledge of this. When you're actually really trying to walk on the spirit and you're trying to guard yourself from iniquity, when people come around you and they speak in obscene language, it grieves your spirit because you know that that language, there's a force behind it. So this is what he's talking about. It's actually grieving the Holy Spirit. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of Elohim, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as Elohim for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Marita, one more time, just so you guys got it. Let all bitterness and wrath, so these are the people who will want to walk in righteousness. This is the servants of Elohim, those that become a saints, right? Let all bitterness wrath, and anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. We have to put those things away from us. And be ye kind one to another. Now these things do. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Allah for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Hold on, I want to get these definitions. Ephesians 4 and 32. This is important. Tenderhearted. Uh, G2155. Having strong bowels. Compassionate. Tenderhearted. Well, compassion that is sympathetic. Pitiful, tenderhearted. So having sympathy. Having compassion one toward another even towards one and another's sins. Not jesting, pulling your brother up when they fall, or your sister. Not forgiving one another. That's one of the things that we as a people have a hard time with. Truly forgiving from the heart. Even if somebody done something wrong to you, even if the person didn't apologize, we have a very hard time with forgiving people and moving on. 
truly forgiving where we're not hanging it over the head. We got work to do. We got work to do Israel and we got work to do Gentiles. We all have a lot of work to do. Me being one. Yeah. We all have our downfalls. So we all have to continue to strive and continue to fight this battle to endure. I don't know if anybody's ever truly looked at the definition of reprobate to understand it. Now, the definition of reprobate says not standing the test, not approved. That's the very first definition, not standing the test. Now, that means that you didn't endure. It doesn't mean that just you fail. That's why the scriptures say a righteous man falls several times, but he gets back up. Because he's standing the test. Although he may fall several times, he's getting back up to continue to endure. He's getting back up and he's not giving up. To be reprobate means that you've given up. You've came to the point that this is just how it is. I can't overcome it. So it just is what it is. This is just how I am. Or you continue rationalizing it in yourself to make what you're doing right and then being held in that place by self-justification. This is the point that none of us want to be at. We all want to continue to strive, even though it's hard. Because a test is always hard. But we have to endure it. We can't give up. We have to continue walking. Although it may be a challenge or a struggle for us, we have to continue walking to, to stand the test so that we can overcome it. So my prayer for everybody is that we be strengthened this day and that we stand the test and that we renew our mind, renew our heart, renew our soul, and that our speech is seasoned with salt. And that good things come forth from our heart and our mind. So, I pray everybody enjoyed the lesson today. Shabbat the Chalam, Sister Diana. Shabbat the Chalam, Brother Hanu. Shabbat the Chalam, the Unifier. Shabbat the Chalam, Dion. Shabbat the Chalam, Chenedu. All right. All right. Bless you all in the name of Ahayo. I hope you all have a wonderful Shabbat today. Um, if you have any questions, you can put them in the comment section or send an email to the Hebrew readers at gmail.com. We definitely bless you. Everybody have a blessed day. Shabbat Shalom. I keep you.